Okay. Brother, two sisters, and mom and dad's over there. And uh, so we're glad to have them this morning. And uh, we've never had nothing quite like that. But it sounds good to me. I like it. Let's sing a little bit more. See, at this time, I think if it'd be all right, should we have the suit our family have their special at this time? You got something to say? Okay. This is a treat for us. Um, it's a blessing uh, with your son so far away to have him uh, in a uh, good church like this under the preaching of uh, probably one of the pastors that I trust more than anybody in the world, uh, Pastor Martin. It's strange how I know so uh, know him personally so little, but I know so much about him and trust him so much through a, a, mutual, a mutual friend, uh, Mike Bowling. And uh, so, Pastor Martin, I appreciate you and uh, appreciate your preaching. And and, uh, and also, it's a special treat uh, today to to uh, meet uh, uh, Nathan Bemis. I've heard about him for many years through Dr. Ruckman, but uh, uh, the first time, a wonderful lesson about the seven mysteries. Appreciate that. And also, the friends we have here, the Nanigers and the Ellers, uh, appreciate the Nanigers uh, taking all that time transporting our son to church. and. And I uh, uh, graduated with, uh, with Brother Eller, and uh, so uh, it's good to see friends, you know? Uh, and it's good to be uh, even, you know, folks, there are Bible believing churches in upstate New York. <laughs> um, not as big as this, but uh, it's a uh, blessing to see a uh, brother of like faith.
Okay, that's a lesson for you. Okay, Brother Bemis is uh, going to preach to you now this uh, morning and this evening, so get both services in if you can at this time, Brother Bemis. All right, uh, is that microphone on? Okay, praise the Lord. I, I, I just uh, love coming out and preaching at you, and I just uh, look at this church a lot like my own church. And uh, so I'm going to give you something that uh, I believe uh, I preached in my church not very long ago. And uh, I'm preparing my people. I'm preparing my people to be tough. And you've got to be tough. And why? Because as we go closer and closer and closer to the rapture, the harder it's going to be to do right. It's hard as it's going to be to be doing what you ought to be doing. Not going to be easy. And the devil's going to put it on you. The flesh going to put you on you. And the world's going to put it on you. So you, there's a thing you need to know as a saint of God. I want you to take your Bible this morning. And I want you to turn to the uh, book of Jonah. Turn to the book of Jonah. And I want you to get a piece of paper, and I want you to write down some things. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would please fill me with the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray you'd help me not to say anything I should say. And Father, please help me to say everything I should say. And Lord, I pray you'd speak to the heart of your people that are here this morning, and also speak to the heart of the unsaved, Father. And may you do your work in Jesus' precious name, I pray, and for his sake, amen. Now, uh, uh, at the, at, if, if you're in the book of Jonah, uh, I want you to go to Jonah chapter uh, 1. And let's begin in uh, Jonah chapter 1. And I want you to write something down. Uh, you got that uh, tape you want to write down on that tape or on your piece of paper or somewhere in your Bible. Write down why Jonah got mad. Why Jonah got mad. And uh, you want to write it down. Unsafe people get mad at God. Some people get mad at God, unsaved people. But at the same time, Christians sometimes also get mad at God. Uh, but uh, most of the time, uh, when they get mad at God, they seem to take it out on somebody else. They seem to have a tendency to not go to God and say, God, I'm mad. It ain't right. It's not fair. You shouldn't do this. And they don't do that. They usually take the finger and point it somewhere else. They usually point it at me. <laughs> or somebody in the pew. <laughs> Most of the time they point it at their wife. Or their husband. Because they're the closest. They very seldom point it at God. So I want you to write some things down. Could have God prevented it. Could have God prevented it. C could have God prevented it? Now, come on, folks. Can God prevent anything in your life? Amen. Couldn't He have stopped it? Amen. He didn't. He didn't stop it. He could have prevented it. So as we get closer and closer and closer to the end, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. So you got to know why Jonah got mad. Now take your Bible and turn to the book of Jonah and turn to Jonah chapter 1. Pick up verse 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amimetel, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh. God has a purpose in mind. God wants a Nineveh to get saved. Go to Nineveh, that great city. And cry against it, for the wickedness is come up before me. But, I look at that next word, but, 
Look what happened. Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish. So Jonah hears the message of go to preach through the Word of God, and Jonah's the man of the hour. And what does he do? He runs the opposite direction, and watch what he does. As he paid, uh, found a ship that went to Tarshish, verse 3, found a ship that went to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down unto it and go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like uh, to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried of a man unto his God, and cast forth the awares that were in the ship to the sea, to lighten them. But Jonah was gone down into the side of the ship, and he lay... Uh, as was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came unto him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise and call upon thy God, if so be that God will uh, think upon us that we perish not. And you know the rest of the story. There's a little uh, place in there, and they took old Jonah, and they argued back and forth and says, uh, do you, you must be the problem, fella. And he said, yeah, I am. I'm running from God. God told me to go preach to the city of Nebra. And I'm just running. I don't want to do that. I'm afraid that he'll just convert the whole city. And I'm just a little bit mad about the whole situation. And they said, well, the only thing we can do is what? And he said, well, just throw me overboard. And uh, so they grab him and over the side of Jonah goes. And God had prepared, prepared a whale for him. And Jonah would have sunk and drowned if there hadn't been for this whale. So this whale comes along and grabs old Jonah and down into the belly of whale uh, Jonah goes. He goes down in there. And he stays down in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. Now the purpose of God of putting Jonah down in the belly of the whale is God's looking for an illustration for the nation of Israel, and it gives them one sign to the nation of Israel when Jesus Christ came. He gives them one sign and only one sign. Now take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 12 and see this one sign that God gives to Jonah. One sign. Turn to Matthew chapter 12, and there's no other sign. Christ said you'll have no other sign but the sign of the prophet Jonah. So turn to Matthew chapter 12, and let's pick up this, because it's very important. Jonah's been down there, and he's been down in the belly of that whale, and some places it's called a fish, so a fish is a whale. And he's been down there for three days and three nights. Now, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. As Jonah was three days... And three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jonah went somewhere, and Jesus Christ went where? Where did it say he went, according to the verse you just read? said he went where? Heart of the earth. Now let's read verse 41. The man, uh, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation, with Christ's generation, and shall condemn it, uh, because they did what? Because they did what, folks? Repented. They repented. Then they repented and got right with God. At that notice, at the preaching of Jonah. So Jonah spends three days down there and three nights down there, and then that uh, whale pukes Jonah back up on the beach. And he's back up on the beach, and he's got a uh, whale vomit falling off this side, and whale vomit falling off that side. He'd been down there for three days. He rolled around like that for a while, and God says, Go preach to Nineveh. He goes, Forty days and forty days, and God shall destroy Nineveh. 
God's drawing a line on the city of Nineveh, and God's giving them one more chance. And he's saying, this is your last chance. If you don't repent, you're done for. Forty days, and God shall destroy Nineveh. Forty days, and God shall destroy Nineveh. And then that city of Nineveh looks and sees Jonah, and the whole entire city repents. The entire city of Nineveh repented. Look at chapter uh, 3. Look at Jonah chapter 3. And look at verse 10. Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. And God saw their works. Let's read verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his furious anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil ways. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do to them. And he did it not. Now look at verse chapter 4 verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very what? So Jonah gets mad at the conversion of hundreds and thousands of people. Would you get mad if somebody here this morning stood up and walked down the aisle and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? Would you go? <clears throat> He's going to do it, ain't he? Or would you say, He's doing it. He's getting saved. He's getting saved. Yes. Ha <laughs> ha! He's getting saved. Wouldn't you say that? That ain't what Jonah says. Jonah goes, <sighs> Yeah, I just knew God was going to do this. Stomps out of the city and stomps up on the eastern side, up on the ridge up there, and he sits down. And it says, verse uh, 2, Jonah chapter uh, 4, verse 2, and, he, uh, and it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Now I want you to write down uh, why Jonah got mad. Why did he go get mad? All right, he was mad because God was going to make him look like a fool. Here you say, how's that? Uh, take your Bible and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18 and pick up verse 22. God was going to make Jonah look like a fool. And that's why Jonah was mad and ticked. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and look at verse uh, 22. Now watch it. Jonah was a prophet of God. And it says, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So Jonah says, He's going to forgive them, and he's not going to destroy them in 40 days like I've been hollering for the last three days that God's going to destroy them, and now God's not going to, and I'm going to look like a fool. So he got mad because God made him look like a fool. Now I'll tell you something. You know what God's going to do to you? He's going to make you look like a fool too. And are going to come down through your Christian life. He's made you look like a fool. And if he hadn't made you look like a fool, you ain't doing right. You said, preacher, show me that one. I'd like to see that one. Good, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if a man doesn't look like a fool, he ain't doing right. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1... Look at verse 18. Now, how many of you believe your Bible is the Word of God? Amen. He made jo Jonah got mad because God made him look like a fool. And you know something? None of you want to look like a fool. Because you're, I don't want to look like no fool. 
Oh, so really, I want to be a nice, sweet little Christian. I don't want to be a nice, sweet little preacher. Don't you call me a nice, sweet little preacher. I'm going to get mad at you if you do. Don't you say, Brother Bemis, he's a nice, sweet little preacher. You're lying! I ain't no nice, sweet little preacher. And you want to be a nice, sweet, sweet little Christian? You do? I want you to read your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross... What's the preaching of the cross? The preaching of the cross is Jesus Christ died for your sins was buried in the grave for three days and three nights, and arose from the grave, and that can, that alone can save you and nothing else. And you say, what's that? That's offensive to people. You know what they want? They want this. Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried in the grave for three days, and arose from the grave. But then you got to do something real good. And join the church. Get baptized. Join my church and live it. And there ain't a denomination in America that will be upset with you if you tell them that. They'll get plenty mad at you if you tell them there's nothing good you can do to be saved. Tell them their own righteousness won't save them. Your baptism will put you in hell. They'll get as mad as you as they can get. Why? Because they don't think that the blood of Jesus is sufficient to save them. They want to believe in the blood of Jesus. Now listen here. Jesus died for my sins, was buried in the grave for three and a half uh, days and three nights, and He arose. Period. Put a period right there. Period. He died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. Period. Period. No denomination in America except Baptists put a period there. The rest of them say there's something good you got to do to it. Get baptized, join the church, sing this why, do something. They just disagree on what the something is. Say they believe in faith and works. Anybody with me say amen. So, why did Jonah get mad? Because he's going to look like he was a fool. Some of you don't want to be looked like as a fool. You witness to somebody and tell them their own righteousness won't save you, and they'll look at you like you're a fool. Look at it says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Then every time he preaches the cross and preaches salvation in this pulpit, he's going to look like a fool, and he's supposed to look like a fool to unsaved people. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. That's what it's supposed to be. That's the way God meant it. And if you're not willing to be look like a fool and you want to look like this sweet, nice, little, kind Christian, and I'm not going to upset anybody and I'm not going to offend anybody, you will offend somebody when you tell them they're going to hell. You'll offend them. Look here. I went knocking on doors with a guy one time. And he was a preacher. And he did this kind of trick here. He was in my church. And he said, preacher, watch this. I said, okay, I'm watching. (laughs) I I was a little worried about when you say that. When you say, watch this, you got to be careful. (laughs) But I was watching. He picked up the phone. He flipped open the telephone book and he went. And then he called that number. And he got a 12-year-old boy. And with the 12-year-old boy, he said, are you a sinner? And he said, yes, I'm a sinner. Did Jesus die for your sins? Yes, he did. Will you ask him to save you? Yes, I will. Dear Jesus, come into my heart and save me. You just got saved. Thank God, born again. Woo, man, you got saved. Amen. Bam. And I said, you're an idiot. (laughs) And the preacher goes like this and says, what's wrong, Brother Bemis? What's wrong? I said, number one, you didn't tell him he was going to hell. Oh, I don't want to upset anybody by telling them they're going to hell. I said, come on, with me, let's go. Let's go. Let's go knock them some doors. We went and started knocking on doors. And I said, now, I got this one. You get the next one. 
I get this one, you get the next one. I get this one, you get the next one. I knock on the door, he get one, I get one. He get one, I get one. And you know something? I said, now, I want you to tell them they're going to hell. He'd get up that door, and he'd go through there, and he'd walk away. He'd, he'd say, preach, I just didn't want to upset him. Just didn't want to upset him. That's what's wrong with you. You don't want to look like a fool. You don't want to upset anybody. That's what Jonah's mad about. He's mad because he looked like a fool. That's what's wrong with you. That's why you haven't won a soul yet. Some of you haven't won a soul yet. And you're going to go to heaven without a soul, without anybody with you. And you're going to go up there and look around and say, Who'd I win to the Lord? Who'd I, did, who'd I win? Who'd I win? And in all your Christian life, you're not going to have anybody. It's terrible. Because you get mad at God because you don't want Him to look like a fool. Get out there and look like a fool for Jesus. You hear me? You say a fool for Christ? Paul says, I'm a fool for Christ. That's the greatest Christian who ever lived. You're supposed to look like a fool. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Say amen. amen. Jonah, did, Jonah couldn't stand that. Couldn't stand that. So he's mad. Now again, take your Bible and turn to Jonah. And turn to Jonah. And turn to uh, Jonah chapter uh, uh, 4. Jonah chapter 4. And look at verse 2. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? Was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before thee to Tarshish, for I know that thou art a what? Gracious God. Is God gracious? Was Jonah right about God being gracious? He forgave the whole city. Jonah knew that. And was mer- and merciful. Jonah knew that God was merciful. And slow to anger. And great kindness. Now underline it. Write it down. Jonah was mad because he knew... He knew how gracious God was, but he didn't care. He knew how gracious God was, but he didn't care. Now, Jonah's been how long down in the belly of the whale? He's been down in the belly of the whale how many days? Three days and three nights. Now, Jesus Christ was how long? In, in the grave. Three days and three nights. Now take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 2. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 2. I want to show you how much grace Jonah knew. Turn to Acts chapter 2. And uh, I, want, I want to show you a verse of Scripture in Acts chapter 2. I want to show you... Uh, in verse, uh, what verse do I want? Uh, verse 27. Acts chapter 2, verse 27. Now watch what it says. How many of you got your Bible and you're open to it right now? Say amen. amen. Because thou will not leave my soul, won't leave his soul where? In where? Hell. That was Christ's soul. So when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary and went into the grave, his soul went to hell. That's where his soul went. Now why did his soul go there? He was down there for three days and three nights. His body didn't go to hell. His soul went to hell. Now, why did his soul go to hell? 
went there for a purpose. Absolute purpose. You say, what's the absolute purpose? My Bible says, I'll show it to you in Scripture. Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John and turn to John chapter 8. Turn to John chapter 8 and uh, see it in Scripture. Got the Gospel of John and in John chapter 8 and look at verse 24. John chapter 8 uh, verse 24 says, And said there, I say, said therefore unto you, that ye shall die, die in Jesus Christ. Did it say die in Jesus Christ? Or it said die in what? In your sins. Now underline it. In your sins. So a man that's not saved dies how? He dies with the sin of rebellion here. He dies with the sin of stealing here. He dies with the sin of of uh, adultery here. He dies with the sin of using God's name in vain. And all his sins, let's say he lives to be 60, 70 years old. He got this sin and 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 this sin. And he dies in his sin and goes to hell with it. And he don't get rid of the sin when he's down there. He still has the sin on him and is still part of him. And he's still a sinner in hell and is part of him. Now, Jesus Christ died for my sins and took my sins off of me and put them on Jesus Christ. Woo! Took my sins off of me and put them on Jesus Christ. Now, you know what he did when he went down to hell? He took your sins, and your sins, and your sins, and your sins, and dumped them there. And dumped them there, and left them there. And then when he come up out of the grave, and went up to heaven, he didn't go into heaven with your sins on him. Do you think think sin's going to get in heaven? How many of you think sin's going to get in heaven? It ain't going to get there, but it ain't going to get there. Sin ain't going to walk in the pretty gates of heaven. Not where a holy, mighty God's at. Sin ain't going to walk in there. My sin is in hell where it belongs. And that's what Jesus Christ did. He died for three days and three nights and went down there, took my sins, and left them there. Thank God my sins are in hell. So, Jonah did what? Take your Bible and turn to the book of Jonah and look at uh, the gospel, look at the book of Jonah and look at Jonah chapter 2. Now take your Bible and look at it. He sh- he knows the grace of God, but he's despised it. He got mad. Sometimes a Christian uh will get mad at God uh and be- even though he knows the depths of the grace of God. Look at uh, Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. Uh, let's, let's go back and uh, pick up uh, Jonah chapter 2. Let's go back and pick up Jonah chapter 2. And let's pick up uh, verse uh, 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cry by the reason of my affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the Belly of what, folks? Underline your Bible. H-E-L-L. Why? Because that's where Christ went. Christ went to hell just like Jonah. So Jonah died, and he went to hell and experienced it. And boy, when that boy come up out of that thing, walked down through the city of Nineveh and said... Forty days and God shall destroy Nineveh. Forty days and God shall destroy Nineveh. He had hell all over him, boy. And those folks saw that and said, Whoo, God's going to do that. That a whole city repented. The animals repented. Everybody repented and got right with God. And God forgave them all. Jonah's out there. <laughs> Mad. And he knew the depths of the grace of God. 
And he still got mad. That's what scrims Christians do. They know they're saved. They know they're a child of God. My Bible says, The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. If you get mad at God sometime in your life, something come across your path and you happen to get mad at God Almighty, don't you tell somebody else before you tell God. Go right straight to Him and say, God, it ain't fair. Write it down. Say, God, it ain't fair. You say, what, what's that being honest? That's honesty with God. That's honesty with Him. When you get mad at Him, you know what you do when you get mad at God? You say, I'm going to live my own life. I'm going to do my own thing. And I'm mad. And I'm going to stay mad. And I, I don't care. That's Jonah. Don't you be a Jonah. Now, look at, uh, look also, why did Jonah get mad? Uh, look also there in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah chapter 4, and look at verse 5. He's, he's mad in Jonah chapter 4, verse 5. It says, uh, let's pick up verse uh, 3. Therefore now, O Lord God, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Verse 3. He's mad at God. He's saying, God what? He's wanting God to do something. What does he want God to do? Kill him. He's so mad at God, he wants God to kill him out there. He said, God, 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 you're going to save him. You saved the whole city up there. You say, what's that guy? What's that guy so ticked about? He's ticked about less. Write it down. Because he won't forgive. Did God forgive the city of Nineveh? So he's mad because he, he didn't want to forgive them. He'd just been happy if they all went to hell. That's what he's happy about. He wouldn't care if they all went to hell. He does not care and has no burden for unsaved people. They don't care. Do you know what happens to a whole bunch of unsaved people? A whole bunch of Christians? You know why they never win a soul to Jesus Christ? Because they really don't care if people go to hell or not. You say, Paul, preacher, I really care. You do? How come you never won a soul to Christ? How come your whole Christian life you've never won one soul? Man, you would win one by accident if you tried. You'd win one by accident and get out there and try. You ain't trying. That's what I think. I think you don't care. I think you're a little bit like Jonah. I think you don't care. Uh, look, look at Jonah right there in, in chapter uh, uh, 4 and verse 5. Uh, and Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth. And he sat under the shadow that it might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd. And he made it to uh, come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from grief. So Jonah was, now watch it, exceedingly glad... For what? For the gourd. So Jonah goes out there, makes him a little booth, and up comes this gourd. Grew up over there, and I mean just a shade all over where. And Jonah goes, ha, ha, man, I love that gourd. Woo, am I a happy camper. I like that gourd. He got happy. He got excited about a gourd. You know what some Christians do? Man, I love my new pickup. I got a new house. Oh, I love my new house. Amen. Gotta give you a worm to eat the gourd. There's a worm for everybody. What do they do? He didn't care about the city going to hell. But boy, he sure cared about that gourd. Man, I love that gourd. That made him a happy camper. Man, I love my pickup. 
There's nothing wrong with a pickup. Hey, there's nothing wrong with a gourd. But he's looking down there and people are going to hell. And he's mad at that. He's happy at the gourd. But he don't care nothing about people going to hell. You got it? Oh, my wonderful gourd. I'm going to get out there and shine my gourd tomorrow. Wax it. Oh, got to take care of my backyard. No, mow the grass, mow the grass. We'll put the flowers up. No, my, I got the best house there is in the neighborhood. Yeah, you do. You care a lot about your gourd. It's just a gourd. It's just a gourd. People are going to die and they're going to go to hell for eternity. You can't take your gourd to heaven. That's the problem, boy. That's why he's mad. Because he doesn't know the value of eternal things over temporary things. Temporary things are only temporary things. It's just a thing. God give me a brand new pickup. And I'm driving it. And I see and he give me a brand new garage. And I'm driving it. And in the garage I go. Bang! Off goes that brand new mirror on the right side. Mirror, mirror's 180 bucks. I go, oh. The Lord says, it's just a mirror. I say, is that right, Lord? It's just a gourd. Thank you for the gourd. <laughs> but it's just a gourd. You know what your problem is? You care more about the gourd, and you're upset about the gourd, and if you lost your gourd, you'd be totally dis devastated because you lost your gourd. God took your house, the bank got it back, and the bank got your truck because you couldn't make the payment. And the backyard's no more your boat, and you had to go out here and live in a dump somewhere. Oh my God, God, how come you're not good to me? And he's saying, what about the city of Nineveh? What about the city of Nineveh? Now let's follow him. Verse 6, And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad uh, of a gourd, but God prepared a worm. Underline, but God prepared a worm. He'll prepare you a worm too, boy. And God prepared a worm. When the morning was rose, the next day it smote the gourd that it was withered. And come to pass, when the sun did rise, that God prepared a venomous east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself that he'd die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry with the gourd, even unto death. You know what it was? He, he, if, if, if I can feel it, and I can touch it, and I can smell it, and I can drive it, and I can enjoy it, it's real. No, it ain't. It ain't real. You know what's real? A man's soul. A man's soul and saved. If I could get a man's soul saved this morning or a woman's soul saved this morning, I would be a happy camper. Because I can take that out into eternity. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And if you don't try to win you a soul and look like a fool, you'll be mad at God and you'll be happy with a gourd. Don't you be so happy with a gourd. There's nothing wrong with a gourd. Which if Jonah had just got up and said, Oh God, thank you for saving the city of Nineveh. Now what's the problem? Let's read a little bit further. And God said unto Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast pity. Take and underline the word pity in your Bible. Underline. It's got all those smashed cars on it about that thick. 
And I see him. And I got about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I say, Lord, thank you. That's where this piece of junk is going. See, it's not eternal. I God give it to me. I didn't do much to get it. I didn't do all anything. God gave give it to me. But it ain't that important. A man's soul. You know, I could excite you. If I could get you excited about winning a soul, I could give you a revival. If I could get you to say, I got to go get me one. I got to go get me one. I'd give you a revival that would excite you for the next year. And an excitement to knowing if I could just say, I'm going to make a fool out of myself today. I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus and I'm going to tell him he's going to go to hell if he don't get saved. I'm going to make a fool out of myself and I'm going to win me a soul. You'd have a revival that wouldn't quit in your heart. And one that will put you close to God that you wouldn't get over for a long time. You talk about everything else. You talk about football, basketball, and then this thing and that thing and everything else. And what about Jesus? What about talking about Him? I went in the store the other day and I got to witnessing to an atheist in the store. And his wife kept going. <laughs> Every time I'd see something, she'd go like that right next to him. She started to smile and I thought she was going to laugh any minute. And we got going back and forth, back and forth, and I witnessed to him. And a bunch of the store uh, people come up and stood around there looking. And I said, they ain't about to stop me. This old man and this old man are going to talk about what we want to talk about. Right there in the middle of that store. And you ain't going to stop us. And they look like that, and they all just turn around and say, we ain't going to stop them. <laughs> well, they wait, wait, we talked there about 30 minutes in the store. And I thought to myself, Lord... I probably won't win him, but I sure told him one more chance about Jesus. One more chance. So when that guy dies and goes to heaven, he can't say, Lord, I never heard. What about the heathen that have never heard? Lord, I never heard. Lord, remember the heathen that have never heard? I never heard. No, nobody ever told me, Lord. You can't put me in hell because I haven't been told. And the Lord's going to say, roll them. Turn the film on, roll them. Here comes this stupid preacher down there. There, there, there he is, turn it on. It was 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning. Turn it on, flip it on, and show this guy where he has no excuse. God needs to be protected. You are protecting God when you tell a man about Jesus and witness to him, because he's going to say, I've never heard. You're protecting God. That's what you're doing. I'm a protecting him, Paul. And so are you. No com uh, pity on a gourd for which thou hast not labored and there made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in night. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein is more than... Three score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. That's a bunch of children. A whole bunch of children that don't know their left hand from the right hand. How many adults must have been there? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of adults there. And they all got right with God and got saved in the Old Testament sense of the word. And Jonah does what? Does he stay mad or does he get right with God? He say, now, Lord, you're right. I really shouldn't be mad. You're right, Lord. I really shouldn't be mad. You know what he does? You listening to me? He wouldn't forgive. He, and he knew the grace of God to its, its deeps. And he still would not get right with God. And when God put him on the spot about the gourd, and he thought his gourd was more important, he still wouldn't get right with God. And he dies bitter and mad with God. That's how Jonah ends the thing up. Mad at God. Now, if you're here this morning, you have that tendency to get a little bit mad at God in your spiritual life, and, you're, and you don't want to talk to Him about it, you're going to be in big trouble because the Lord's just going to say, okay, I'll back away from you then, and you can go ahead and be mad about something I did. I said, I did it, and if you're mad about it, that's 
okay, and I won't say no more about it. God's going to put some things across your past that will make you mad. And if you don't think God won't ever make me mad, He'll make you mad and make me mad, and I'll be upset and I'll say, God, why are you doing this? Lord, it's not fair you should do that. Well, see, that's the way it ought to be. You meet, get mad at God and you talk it over with Him and you change that attitude and say, God, give me a burden for lost souls going to hell. Every eye closed and every head bowed. Now, right now, with every eye closed and every head bowed and the saints of God praying, you have something inside of you just a little bit mad at God and you won't move, you're stubborn, and you refuse to listen to what God says, and you refuse to be compassionate and gracious, and you don't have a forgiving heart, you're, you're going to get up and walk out the building this morning, and as you walk out with that, that unforgiveness, then something's going to happen. Lord, just going to say, all right, if that's what you want to do, okay. And then he's going to back away from you. And if you're lost, you're going to stay lost. And I'm telling you something, you don't want to stay lost another minute. That another five or six years in your life that without Jesus Christ could bring about some terrible things. And if you're saved and you're a little bit mad at God, I can bring about some things in your life that are just going to make, just des destroy you as a Christian. Oh, you'll go to heaven. You're still saved. But boy, it sure be disastrous to you. Will you stop being mad at God and say, God, I shouldn't be mad. I shouldn't be mad. Oh, God, I don't want to be. Now, how many of you here this morning raise your hand and say, Preacher, I am just a little bit mad at God. I want you to pray for me. I want you to raise your hand. Will you? Thank you. Is there another? Is there another? How many of you can honestly say from your heart, preacher, if I'm mad at God, I sure don't know it. Can you put your hand up? Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. That's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. There are quite a few that you, that you know that everything's right between you and the Lord. Now, if you don't know Jesus Christ, Will you step out of your seat and come right now as we sing? Let's sing hymn number 388. 388. You hear him now? Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Now, if, you, if you've never been saved, you've never been saved, you're that, that Jonah, and you're just kind of right down inside, you're just kind of like that, and just kind of a little bit mad about it, mad about what God's doing. You're like that. You're not saved. Well, you say, not anymore. I'm going to get saved, get right with God, and I'm going to do it now. See, it's up to you. You're the one that is the deciding factor. God has already done everything He's going to do to save you. He died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, and He's calling, He wants to save you, and He'll save you in a heartbeat if you ask. Will you ask? If you're a Christian, you can get everything right right now. Will you come? God talk to your heart, you come. If you're not saved, come on. Okay, now I want you to do something. If you know you're saved and know you're going to heaven when you die, I want you to raise your hand. 
Keep it up there. Keep it up. Okay, thank you. Now, if you couldn't raise your hand, you couldn't raise your hand, you got a problem. And you got a big problem. And you better get it right, and you better do something about it, and you better not let it slide. Because you just might wake up in hell. Now, you understand what I said? Don't go to hell. Don't go there. It's a terrible place, and it's a terrible thing. There are only two men in the Bible that died and come back from death and come back from that place, and Jesus Christ is one of them. Jonah was the other. God was gracious with Jonah, showed him something, and he still didn't care. God saved your soul from hell, and some of you still have not won anybody Jesus Christ yet. I want every eye closed right now, every head bowed. Now, if you've never won a soul to Jesus Christ, I want you to be honest, nobody looking around. Say, preacher, I've never won a soul to Jesus Christ, but I want to. Will you raise your hand? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. That's several you hear this, this, this morning. Thank you. Put it down. Thank you. That's too many. That's too many people. Now, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're spending your time on. I don't know what you're spending your effort on. But you've got to do something. Or you're going to go to heaven alone. And you ain't going to have nobody. And I hope it's not because you're mad at God. But you need to start telling somebody they're going to hell and start telling them what Jesus did for them. Will you win you one? Is there no compassion in your heart? Don't you care? Man, if you stick with it, you're going to get... If a guy goes fishing enough, he's going to catch a fish. If a guy stays around the barber shop long enough, he's going to get a haircut. Now, will you win one? Let's sing one more stanza.
Amen. Lord bless you.